Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Politics of Gender, the baddest podcast in the Western Hemisphere. We are here today with our second book club edition, namely Gender. Gender. An appropriately named book for a podcast about gender. Ivan Illich is the guy, and he is an odd man, a mm -hmm. genius. Very um, cynical. Probably the most cynical guy I've ever read. Um, Which makes him really fun to read. <laughs> yeah, so just buckle up, everybody, because he's not going to say anything nice about anyone you like, as far as I can tell. Right. Fair enough. So uh, today we are looking at the first three chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to follow along with the book or if you want to pick it up late, you can find the link to the PDF. Um, and then we'll, we'll pick up the next three chapters, the next podcast, and then end with the last one for our last one. That's right. So that's what we're doing today. He begins chapter one, sexism and economic growth with, um, the maybe paradoxical, uh, assertion that with more economic growth, we get more sexism, mm -hmm. which and doesn't seem to be obvious. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah. It, you can tell that he uh, enjoys poking people and watching them squirm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the first the first chapter, he sets out his basic premise, which is that. And then pretty quickly on, where does he say it? Uh, he's he's trying to oppose, I guess, two ways of understanding gender one he calls the what's it the the reign of vernacular gender yep and then the regime of economic sex is the mm -hmm. others so this is really important because i think if you're just following on and looking for like the good thing and the bad thing generally speaking in today's climate gender is the bad thing uh, i'm some from a conservative position here gender yeah. is the bad thing and mm -hmm. sex is the good thing because sex is like the real biological fact and gender is right. like the made up queer theory um psychological reality right that's basically switch that switch that entirely in your head and mm -hmm. you have illich's um description admittedly he says in the beginning that he's going to use words differently um and this is just how he's using the word so gender um ref they both refer to a duality but to two different kinds of duality um and for him, economic sex is a product of industrial capitalism, of everything he opposes, um, it seems apparent, uh, whereas vernacular gender is his attempt to describe a world that was deliberately destroyed or a way of relating man and woman um, that was deliberately destroyed in order to make way for economic sex. Mm -hmm. Fair. So, so another way of looking at it, if you've been following this for a while, these are two different constructions of gender right. or sex and so he splits the words that way what yeah. one one thing i do like that he says in the beginning he points out and I, i've read this other places that well, one of the reasons why <laughs> the conversation about gender is so confusing is because the way that it's used today is just not the way the term has been used for forever gender was a grammatical term mm -hmm. we're just talking about nouns and so uh yeah, he says it distinguishes places, times, tools, tasks, forms of speech, gestures, and perceptions that are associated with men, associated with those tasks, and also with the ones associated with women. So um, if anyone has learned, I don't know, Spanish or Latin, then you know that all nouns fall into these three mm -hmm. different categories, um, masculine, feminine, or neuter, and it was just the way that languages organically developed uh and so that's why he uses gender to describe vernacular cultural gender at least the the pre-modern construction mm -hmm. is because he's tying it in with language yeah so let's talk about exactly what that looks like he is he says that an industrial society cannot exist unless it imposes certain unisex assumptions. The assumptions that both sexes are made for the same work, perceive the same reality, and, ha and have, with some minor cosmetic variations, the same needs. Um, Which page is this? This is on f nine. nine. 
Okay. He says, and the assumption of scarcity, which we're going to talk about a little bit, which is fundamental to economics, is itself logically based on this unisex postulate. There could be no competition for work between men and women unless work had been redefined as an activity that befits humans irrespective of their sex. The subject on which economic theory is based is just such a genderless human. And then he goes on, then with scarcity accepted, with all this accepted, the unisex postulate spreads, which is to say that insofar as we accept the theory, we tend to live like the theory is true, and then the way we live confirms the theory. So mm -hmm. he's talking about a social order that develops with a particular uh, view. Now, let's just back up and, and take that one step at a time. Um, he is saying that you cannot have capitalism without destroying gender. I think that's really important. He mm -hmm. goes right for the jugular there. Uh, and the reason he says this is because um, a industrial society, so a society uh, in which um, the goal is for production and especially the production of profit, um, and that's taken to be the motive for um, human action, which is um, to always be exchanging one state of affairs for another one um, that's ultimately profitable to an individual. Um, this is positing a... Uh, world in which everyone can be treated um, in basically the same way. So everyone's an individual, everyone is seeking profit, everyone, so at some other point in this essay, he uses the term uh, homo economicus. So everyone is an economic man, an economic mm -hmm. being. And the differences between man and woman are simply variations on that fundamental thing. So you might like something in particular because you're a woman, I might like something in particular as a man, but what we're describing is just a variation on the fundamental human experience, mm -hmm. uh, which is an individual in competition with all other individuals uh, in a universe of scarcity. So in a universe in which the goods that we have are only achieved by winning a violent competition with other individuals. So basically, liberalism. Fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, um, I think both Augustine and Thomas uh, talk about how you, you can know uh, a people or people are united by the thing that they love and mm. in a capitalist society that's money and wealth uh production and attainment of wealth becomes i don't the the social currency mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how he sees the i guess the the movement of one construction into the other so if we move into a world that's being driven by money this becomes um like the ultimate paradigm by which you like see people and start arranging mm -hmm. the world. And so you start to see people as being unisex workers. Right. Yeah. The um, worker is not a sexed unit. The worker is uh, whoever can do the job. Yeah. And I, I think and do it for cheap. Well, right. And, and I think so the most cynical way of describing what he's saying is that what we have here is not actually a view of the human person first. First, it's a way to make money. And one of the obvious ways to make money um, is to have more labor available as a commodity. And in pre-modern societies, uh, it's basically true that the first people to be able to move into factories, into um, the work of in industri industrial society, um, were men. And... So the presumption that men and women are variations of the of fundamentally the same economic unit is profitable for the people that basically rule the world because there is a whole unutilized field, namely the field of females, women, um, that is not yet also working. Mm -hmm. Now, this is tough because we always think of the movement into work as being part of the liberation of women from injustice and tyranny, and I think there that is true within our societies. But what Illich is pointing out is the very movement into capitalism to begin with is one in which we try to redescribe the human person, whoever he is, whoever she is, as fundamentally a worker whose labor is a commodity um, which can be bought, sold, exchanged. Um, and he's distinguishing this from a world in which there were non-exchangeable differences between men and women such that mm -hmm. there's some things that women just could not do, not just because they happened to be incapable, but because it wasn't, didn't belong to their world. In a similar way, there are things, works and things that men could not do um, 
not because again they were necessarily incapable but because it didn't belong to them to their world right so on page 13 um he says that economic discrimination against women cannot exist without the abolition of gender and the social construction of sex so again he's talking about that that switch from and we'll, 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 we'll get to the, the gendered worlds. I mean, we really haven't touched on it at sure. all and we keep referencing it, but yeah. that that's the third chapter. So we'll get more into that, um, later on. But when, when, when the difference is not acknowledged and then you also have a society that values people based off of capital then you're creating a unisex playing field for both men and women where they're considered like exactly the same and what tends to happen is that if you are evaluating people based off of their ability to gain money then women consistently fall behind yeah and this is a little different than the argument that women are just unfairly treated because that obviously Mm -hmm. happened like the strict sense of like both men and women working basically the same jobs but women being paid less Right. Is actually, I think that's a maybe that, that superficially that's what it looks like he's saying, but I don't think that's quite right. Um, so envy, envy of the other is only possible where the idea of two distinct worlds has been destroyed, right? So when we are considered as basically human beings with modifications, then because we are both human, because we're both, yeah, because we're both human, most primarily, then when something is given to me and not to you or to you and not to me it can be the source of envy because hey i share what is most fundamental i am a human also therefore i should have x y or z um the reason that illich argues that economic development um by which as far as i can tell just means the spread of capitalism um is always and everywhere sexist i think it's just because women have babies now he didn't say this exactly, but I think in in reading this, he's talking about a way in which women are structurally always behind. Mm-hmm. Like no matter, and he talks about this. Like yeah, you can give them access to career, you can give them access to education, but when you make the comparison, at the end of the day, women and he uses wage, which granted the numbers have changed, but for him, he's looking at the wage difference and saying, no matter what we do, the wage difference always remains. Right. Right. Um, There's a a really helpful part before we go too into that on page 24. I don't know. Now we're kind of moving into the second chapter at this point. We might just kind of go back and forth. Yeah. There's still some, some good parts in chapter one. That's helpful. But um, yeah. So, so like what you were saying, he says today, the law keeps all curricula and careers open for women Um, But in 1880, many of both were close to them. Today, women averagely spend 28 years in employment. In 1880, the average was five. These all seem like significant steps towards economic equality until you apply the one measuring stick that counts. The median yearly earnings of the average full-time employed woman still hovers around a magical ratio, three to five, of a man's average earnings. And then he goes on and gives some other... um, Stats. So I I remember when I was reading this, I well I was just trying to understand like what exactly he was saying, especially because I was aware like you know this is like written a while ago. Yeah. Probably the numbers are out outdated. Yeah. Um, and probably there was a lot more disparity between like the the gauge wage gap um between men and women that has been remedied. But like we also know that there is a significant wage gap still but usually what you hear people on the right insisting is like well um women just are choosing different careers than men Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they're not as high paying so that adds to the wage gap or a lot of the like highest ceo positions just absolutely drain your life away and you have to just give your entire life and all of your hours over to this and most women don't actually desire that lifestyle so that adds to it and then if you also have maternity leave right um or if you have children or if you want to be a stay-at-home mom so like here's here's all these extra 
I guess, uh, additions to the data that we can say, okay, well, like this isn't, this isn't actually sexist. Right. But I think, I think what Illich is getting at is that if, if we're living in a unisex world and your value in the way that, uh, I guess like the economy looks at you is by money, that is the one measuring stick that counts. So you might have all these factors as to why women aren't making as much, but like the point is if that's the measuring stick that counts, then women are always going to be behind. Right. We're judged for all those reasons. We're judged by the society that we're in. And our society definitely judges us according to um, making money. Mm-hmm. And the point is that you could argue, well, uh, yeah, but women want to have babies as well as make money. So this sort of balances it out. But that's exactly, I think, what Illich is saying. Yeah. Naming that, okay, right. So within a society in which the uh, economic human being um, goes forth to profit, to make money by selling his labor as a commodity, um, insofar as that is a social goal, and that's a description of, of who we are, then women are always um, ineffective men in the sense that they perform, they don't attain the goal as well. So maybe the way that they don't attain the goal as well is because they just pick a different job mm-hmm. that isn't as high paying, right? Maybe the way they don't perform as well is they do pick a same job, but it's they take time off mm-hmm. to have kids or whatever it is. Uh, maybe the way they don't perform as well is they just stay at home to be a mom. But The point is that in any case, they're not performing as well. Mm -hmm. In any case, um, as, and this is, this, this is important because as economic growth continues and as it more fully envelops the entirety of a society, um, those differences become greater and greater points of friction of, of competition Mm -hmm. because then it seems like, um, okay, I am human being. I'm homo economicus, just like this guy, but I have this other thing, namely the desire to have a child. Um, and to do it, I have to sacrifice what is most fundamental and most valued within society. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then even, and you see this right now, even child rearing becomes a sort of personal individual choice that you make and you, you know, you have your child and then you do it in such a way that you can get back to work, which is the real stuff. Um, and that's what's really valued in society. And we would be silly to deny that that's a pressure that, that all women seem to feel, at least within this country. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. So if that's, if that's your value, if you have, yeah, if you have other, other desires like having children, um, your worth is still, you can still attain it, but it's just going to be a lot more work for a woman because yeah. she has to raise a child. And his point right in the first chapter is that there's no point of comparison with pre-modern societies because they don't have the same goals. So for instance, mm-hmm. it's not that women weren't also having children and, and being suffering that and delaying various things they wanted because of that. Um, this is not a supposed to be a kind of rosy image here. Uh, the point is that they are not being – those women are being posited as as occupying a world that is closed in the sense that it really is just occupied by other women. Um, that there is such a thing as being a woman that isn't a variation of what it means to be a man and that this mm-hmm. has – this is a life with its own fulfillments, its own disappointments. But the point is that you don't within this pre-modern world, if what Illich is saying is true, you don't sit back and say – Oh, now I have now I'm pregnant. Now I have a kid. Now you know it's that time of my menstrual cycle, and I am losing vis-a-vis the male who doesn't have this thing, who doesn't have pregnancy. You know, and, mm-hmm. and this is just like uh, like this is obvious and known w- within corporations that are basically funding uh, abortion and contraception for women to be able. Like, what is liberatory is precisely that they can through medical interventions. Um, be freed from these relative setbacks, setbacks yeah. relative to to the non setbacks of the yeah, male. Yeah, like you have to suppress your body into being a male body, so yeah. that you can have more time to work and make money. Totally. And one of Illich's points is that like the feminist argument is like, okay, well then let's just remunerate women or or provide props wherever those those um, mm-hmm. problems are. Okay, it's so like, women oh, she are. She can't. She can't 
like be a man and she can't have a, a male body well how about we compensate for that yeah let's compensate so okay she's pregnant she can have an abortion she uh wants to get pregnant uh later let's delay it with contraception she is pregnant and wants to have the baby let's make sure we have good maternity leave um you know none of these things well i think some of these things are bad in themselves yeah. maternity leave i don't think is bad i think it's awesome uh relative to our society i mean i actually think <laughs> i think it should be a lot more than maternity leave i think there should be like like you know period leave and such but that'd be very interesting <laughs> <laughs> but um you know the the compensation is obviously just pushing the thorn a little bit deeper right because mm -hmm. you only have compensation where you have a relative lack it's like yeah we could adjust society to constantly have inputs of capital to make sure that um women are are making the same wage as men where that's the measure where, yeah. but then woman is resentful precisely because man doesn't need all of that comp compensatory work i really like the word adjust that you just use <laughs> so yeah okay so there's this disparity so what are we going to to do are we going to adjust the social world to actual women or are we going to like adjust them by giving them more money or mm -hmm. contraceptives and i think that's probably a more helpful way to understand what the gendered world is um it's a like a social world that's adjusted for actual women wow yeah that's actually really clarifying <laughs> <laughs> sorry we've been like struggling to like put into words i think you just did it yeah it's a it's a world adjusted for the reality and not like people being, adjusted for being the world pregnant or yeah or just having a female body isn't like ah crap now you can't do the thing that we want you to do just right. pause right i like guess this is part of the the system of uh yeah and it, it's, existence. and it's really tough because we do live in our world right as much as you know some of us would like to occupy medieval france or whatever uh, <laughs> we're here and so it's very hard to say like to imagine an existence in which in which having children um is not viewed enviously vis-a-vis -vis, uh someone who's not having children um but the assertion that illich is making is that that really existed we're not even the desire to compete was there like fields of competition okay i'm gonna back up a little bit illich Ilitch. he's all about well, he's all not about scarcity okay now i'm not going to go on a huge thing about this but when he talks about a regime of scarcity he's talking about um turning a subsistence um world in which people um are simply living they're doing the things necessary to live um to one in which um resources are viewed as scarce and in which people work to attain those resources over and against other people um so when he when one of the ways that you can describe for Illich's sort of distinction between the pre-modern world and and the modern world is the introduction of scarcity into the sexual relation right so mm -hmm. um now things that were given as goods belonging to men and women by nature um, are now commodities squabbled over by economic neuters who are plagued by their sex as this addition to their body he has this one so illich writes this whole book in footnotes um so oh yeah that's another yeah so <laughs> it, this book is mostly footnotes and the footnotes are like little essays in themselves um he says that they're like uh for further study so I really do encourage an actual yeah, reading the, of this the, book. The footnotes but... are great, but if you if you are reading this on your own, I would suggest just getting through the chapter because otherwise you get too bogged down with yeah, footnotes. Yeah. And then go back and make your way through but the footnotes. But I am going to read a footnote, just a part of it. So this is footnote 6, page 12. Um, he says, The contemporary, genderless, possessive individual, the subject of the economy, lives by decisions based on considerations of marginal utility, Every economic decision is embedded in a sense of scarcity and thus tends towards a kind of envy unknown to the past. All right. So that's simply his description of what's new about the way we act because we all act within a universe seen as scarce. We're all mm -hmm. more fundamentally given to envy than any other time in human history. And what we're seeing right now in a 
sort of the degraded relation between man and woman is a consequence of this. Yeah, although he doesn't, he, I mean, he doesn't use the word envy. I don't recall. No, he, showing he's, up. I think what he uses yeah. is competition. Yeah, I think he uses that that word. So on page ten, yeah, not in the footnotes. Um, he says there could be no competition for work between men and women mm-hmm. unless work had been redefined as an activity that befits humans irrespective of their sex. And so I, I think what he's he's getting at is that com- competition is not like right wing like competition this is what's gonna like bring like in like good small businesses is what we need for society to flourish that's not the way that he's using competition it has a very cynical undertone because it's the assumption that we have to economically fight to the death yep in order to succeed yep and your success is measured in wealth and so um i i think what he's getting at with with competition is that when when you put men and women on the same exact playing field in a unisex world and then you tell them that resources are scarce and they have to compete and then the tension that exists between men and women is not the tension of like the the dance that we'll see later on in chapter three but it's it's a like a fight to the death yeah happiness is always had at the expense of the other um, so if men get happiness, especially if you think about it in terms of if wages really are the, the yeah. marker, it's like, well, there's only so much. So anyone grabbing a chunk of money for themselves mean that means that someone else is not getting it. Um, and so, yeah, the competition, which is, and we shouldn't be surprised, right? Because competition is described by the sort of architects of liberalism, as being the original state of nature. Um, And so to see Mm -hmm. this playing out with in sexual differences is is a very short step. It's like, yeah, Um, the desire to be a man or the desire to be a woman from the opposite sex is to be expected from a world described in such a way and lived in such a way. So that's the first chapter where he kind of really basically lays it out, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And gives us a he's mysterious thus far. So if you're feeling like, wait, but I really don't get what vernacular gender is, then you're reading the book. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it hasn't really come up yet. Um, there's, there's one last part from the first chapter I'd like to take a look at. Cause I think it's helpful. And this is on page 20. So, um, he gives his, his definition of social gender or vernacular gender and then economic sex and there's, it's still kind of confusing, so I think it's just helpful to read and then look at it, and then we can move on a little bit past that. So he says, By social gender, I mean the eminently local and time-bound duality that sets off men and women under circumstances and conditions that prevent them from saying, doing, desiring, or perceiving, quote, the same thing, end quote. Um, yeah. It's confusing reading that the first time because at first um, – or I guess for me, it was like the second time I was reading it. I was like, wait, what What exactly is he saying? Um, and it's not that he's saying that vernacular gender was when men and women occupied um, different spheres and women were arbitrarily barred from doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not really the dynamic that he's concerned with. Yeah. Um, like he knows that that has happened um but when he's describing vernacular gender that's that's just like not the subject that he's really talking about yeah maybe a positive way to put what he's saying is that vernacular gender is the attempt um the human attempt to have peace between man and woman sometimes that thing he said about well it's what makes sure we don't desire what the same thing as the other person immediately Mm -hmm. gives us the image of being refused a desire. So like, well, I have this desire to have the same goods as the other person, but I don't get it. Um, And this is proper to liberal regimes because our view of justice is essentially fairness. Um, You know, I I was speaking about this with you earlier that if you look at any um, typical complaint prior to modernity of like an offended woman, the argument that she makes is to justice that her sex has been wronged in some way um 
Whereas if you look to a offended woman with a modernity, the argument is, is towards equality. Mm -hmm. Namely, I should be treated the same as the male. And in that distinction, I think you have a vision or a glimpse into both worlds. Yeah, it's a, it's not, well, I need to do justice to you because of who you are as a woman. It's, I need to do justice to you as a unisex citizen. Yeah, as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's Which some... is not, yeah, it's just not taking in someone for their particular existence. It's, yeah, just treating them like a neutral, yeah. cool thing. And already we see how gender is political in that if it is the case that human beings have organized themselves um, up until modernity in such a way as to prevent men and women from desiring the same thing, um, then to create a world in which it is natural, to build a construct in which it feels natural, it's a second nature to desire the same things as each other, is to create a different political order where justice does mean something different. Mm -hmm. um, and where yeah so it's not as if like civil justice for women being abused is like is, is not a good thing it's like this is no. the structures that we we have and we have a, a structure where we can't we can't provide justice to you like as a woman totally yeah like if you go to court you got to make the argument for being treated like someone else because we don't actually make arguments related to like the good or the true that would be silly <laughs> so um going back to that one sentence um that prevent uh, men and women from saying, doing, desiring, or perceiving the same thing. I think what he's really talking about is what we talked about earlier from from being each other. Like we we know that men and women desire the same thing, but we also know that they don't. Yeah, like when we say men and women desire the same thing, like we we all desire happiness mm -hmm. um, or maybe like control or power mm -hmm. in our life, but the way that it manifests is just different and i think that's what he's saying social gender is um like you want the same things but you don't um you know what the first time a man and woman wanted the same thing was no uh when they both ate the apple ah killing it oh that was terrible but it is a part <laughs> i do think that i think that's true i think like the the genesis story uh in the bible generally um because we might feel like there's a certain hmm. well it's not it's not really it's not really like that you want the same thing it's like it's it's being being the same well yeah you, you rene girard calls this metaphysical desire it's when you actually want the being of the other person because your own has become in doubt like whether you really are living and mm -hmm. whether it's not in fact that other person that's really living and you want to somehow get at their being that's how rene girard describes envy and you know if you look at the Garden of Eden story, and you have a, a sort of original male-female difference. It's it's um, the fall happens in and through um, that difference being put aside and both uh, envying something that exceeded them, namely the desire to be like gods. Um, we don't need to go there, though, because that would be quite a theological term for now. Mm -hmm. um, but we could talk about the priesthood. For a short sec. Do it. Um, I, I think when we're trying to understand what he's talking about, um, thinking about how the modern world is not able to comprehend the priesthood at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, makes perfect sense of it. Or yeah. like why, like I, as a woman, like I love theology. I, I have no envy for the priest. I do not want to be a priest. Like I appreciate uh, the male fraternity greatly. Like, I think priests are awesome, but I don't want to be a part of that world. And I think that's kind of incomprehensible to a lot yeah. of people. Like, I know, like, I'll, like, talk to um, extended family who are um, Protestant, and then the response is like, oh, like, so, like, you want to be, like, a like a priest or a minister? No, I do not. <laughs> because I, I know that it's, I don't want to be a man. <laughs> Yeah, um, it it's not a like suppressed desire. It's not a desire in the first place. Yeah, which... and I I think yeah, in in a world that sees people as being unisex and and I don't know, people just I don't think they understand that the priesthood is not like a collection of powers and abilities. 
Mm-hmm. Like it has to do with who you are, mm-hmm. um, like as a spiritual father and as a woman that's, I don't desire that. Um, yeah, I think that that's one thing that can help put it into context. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I think if there's anything that you have so strongly associated with the other sex that you didn't have to like suppress a desire for it, but in fact have never really thought about desiring it, you have an inkling into uh, the uh, reign of vernacular gender. And I think it's important to re- recognize those moments in ourselves because Illich is not, I don't think he's arguing that like the reign of economic sex. The regime of economic sex has totally destroyed the reign of yeah. That's uh, why it's confusing vernacular to gender. Me. I think that like most things within modernity, vernacular gender is just under siege. It's just like every time that we have an experience of it, we run against the deliberate construct of the human being as an androgynous unit, right? And so we have to sort of either modify our own experience to make it fit, um, or just compartmentalize it. Like, well, okay, so there's like difference within the private life of boys and girls. And there's a few general things that are belong to each sex, but we know really that those are just not that important. Um, and that when you, you know, get into the fullness of public life, you're all androgynous units, citizens, uh, workers, etc. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think that comes into a little bit further relief in, uh, the second chapter economic sex. So yeah. now he's just describing, the current situation and his his main thesis is that uh yeah with with capitalism with modernity it's automatically going to be sexist because again you have your one measure which is economic um success Mm -hmm. uh and women are going to be discriminated or just not measure up the same way no matter what and this is this is where i remember reading it and like okay some of the the that is just not up to date anymore. Um, there's more things that you can factor in, but what he does, he um, divides this chapter into three sections, the reported economy, the unreported, and shadow work. And what he's saying is that here's three areas of uh, the economy where women are discriminated against yeah. differently. Yeah. So the reported economy, he means that which can be measured by the use of money. So that that which we can get federal stati- statistics on, that which mm-hmm. is taxed, that which is available to economists who are predicting the rise of, or fall of GDP. Um, so it's all of the legitimate stuff. Yeah. So that's, I mean, we kind of already talked about this in the beginning. That's when he had the, the quote about how the, the median yearly earnings of the average full-time right. woman – still three to five ratio yep um and yeah he doesn't he doesn't specifically talk about pregnancy but again that idea that time is money and if you yeah if you're a woman and you're pregnant then you just you don't have time yeah i mean it's it's so obvious that it maybe bears repeating because it's when you make labor a commodity, then you're selling your hours. Yeah. Like, okay, I'll give you my hour for 20 bucks. Well, that'd be a good job. I'll give you my hour for eight <laughs> bucks. That's why I like it. Um, and when I when I do, I've made a, a sort of contractual agreement. Um, the, the point is that that's sort of the universal vision of the human person from the, from the standpoint of capitalism, which is mm-hmm. that uh, labor is fundamentally a commodity available for sale over and against I think our experience of work, the dignity of labor, everything the popes have tried to say. Mm-hmm. Um, nevertheless, we plow forward with the idea that we have work as like a pile of wood that we sell right. <laughs> until so it goes away. <laughs> the more the more time you have, the more, the more that you can you successfully navigate the world, mm-hmm. which is why it seems like the ideal would be a single male because yeah. you can yeah, you have you have the most time. Totally. You don't have to have like contraceptives to keep your body from functioning like a normal yeah. body. And you just got labor for sale, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's totally. So if right. you have more, if yeah, if you have more time, then you automatically have more money. As soon as you have less time, then you experience discrimination, which I think is his whole argument in this chapter. Yeah, the kind of consequence of which is that if you really want to smash capitalism, you should just get pregnant. But. <laughs> 
that's not the point. Um, we've got, we understand, I think, the uh, reported economy. Now, the unreported mm-hmm. economy, and, and I think we understand how sexism exists there, right? Because yeah. this is his point. Each one is sexist. Reported economy is sexist uh, for the simple reason of time. Um the unreported economy also sexes. So the unreported economy is where anything that can't be measured. Um, so he uses a lot of examples of like black market exchanges, yeah. things that aren't taxed. But basically wherever we still barter, um, not that you couldn't use money, but wherever we sort of I don't know, pay people under the table or say, hey, I'll do – I'll fix your deck if you do my taxes because you're a tax guy, um, things that can't be measured. And it's funny because technically all barter is supposed to be registered with the IRS. So there's this like desperate (laughs) appeal from our administrative states to say like, hey, if you give part of your cow to this guy for mowing your lawn, you need to calculate the economic value of that and tell us, which is hilarious because who the heck would ever do that? Um, I guess if you had some kind of awesome like – puritanical devotion to the administrative state you might and a type like a personality and you're like really it is enjoyed my, it too it is my moral duty to <laughs> to but but even then it's like well how do you figure out the real value of your barters it's like you're gonna make arbitrary monetary okay anyways point is it's stupid it's known to be stupid <laughs> but since we live in administrative states they're like well we can't see it if you don't register so register please 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 uh but that's the unreported economy it's all those things that we just do but don't mm-hmm. see um, and, yeah, yeah. I, I think his point about that is that within the unreported economy, women tend to be excluded from the desirable desirable jobs in the growing arena of illegitimate work. Yeah, which I can't really speak to. That's not what my job is. I mean, hard to say. I Actually, definitely, you know, people that are going around mowing my lawn are tend to be guys. Economy. What's your unreported economy? This tutoring, yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. I do do that. It is a desirable job. It's, it's a nice situation. <laughs> yeah. So he says his basic point is that there's just the dream of the regulated economy is that if there is discrimination, we can put all these inputs in to get rid of it. So we can just mm-hmm. you know have affirmative action. We can increase wages. We can you know give free contraception, abortion, etc. Uh, obviously none of this applies within an unregulated sector. So he, so he says, you know, in contra, uh, yet in this sector of the market economy where new jobs are created as reported unemployment rises, women might be getting an even worse deal than in the sector. The econ- economists data dragnets can filter and measure here. No anti-discrimination or equal opportunity laws apply in contrast mm-hmm. to male moonlighters, drug dealers, and bribe takers who, whose pursuits are lucrative, if sometimes unlawful. Women are left with a shoddy consolation of prostitution, puny extortions, and fencing. I presume fencing does not mean sword fighting in this context, no. but I wasn't around <laughs> in the 80s, so what do I know? Women who attempt moonlight moonlighting typically wash the dishes next door or do typing at home or more recently cover the night shift on the text composer, which I presume is a computer. Um, um, another yeah. another thing that was kind of helpful – from me reading this, I can't remember where, where he says, that. I don't know if it's even in this chapter, is that um, he's saying that, okay, well, equality can be achieved and it usually happens with the elites or maybe you could argue like the upper middle class. Yeah. But for the vast majority of people, this is what he's concerned about is like what, what happens like to your like average wage making yep. woman, like what happens to the lower class? Yep. Like, are they actually being served by this economy? And I think for Catholics concerned about Catholic social teaching, yeah, that's that's the primacy of the the poor. Like, we need to be asking ourselves, okay, so in a in a society that's structured the way it is, like, what happens to the, the poor? Totally, yeah, and and he, this is part of Illich's overall resistance to professionalization of everything. So, like, he doesn't think there should be like the kind of administrative reported. I I get the sense that he would like to live in a completely unregulated sort of uh, world, which would obviously have its own problems. But it does seem to me that if women lose in the um, reported economy because of the time to money ratio, um, they lose in the unreported economy because by definition it is um, 
people are essentially having to bring their own strength to bear in any negotiation mm -hmm. on the worth of something. And it seems that generally there's a certain like ability to take advantage of others because where the presumption yeah. is that there should be regulation, then when you're doing something without regulation, you're much more likely to be, um, exploitive yeah whereas yeah. if the presumption is a lack of regulation well then just justice applies you should be just and it's weird not to be just mm -hmm. but i think that's all he's saying here um he takes um yeah but then he moves on because i think i think that much is fairly obvious but what he really wants to talk about is obviously shadow work yes um so shadow work is a realm of work that is not actually compensated. Um, and it is the kind of work that we don't think of as work. And because of this, it can be hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. um, he gives a definition on page 48 that's Sweet. useful to start with. Um, Shadow work is performed by the consumer of commodities, specifically the consuming household. I call shadow work any labor by which the consumer transforms a purchased commodity into a usable good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he goes on, I designate as shadow work the time, toil, and effort that must be expended in order to add to any purchased commodity the value without which it is unfit for use. So um, when we were talking earlier, uh, the word barter was helpful for me. And, and understanding it. So it's, it's a situation where it's, you don't barter for goods. Yeah. You just do, you just do the work so that you can enjoy the good. Yeah. So he thinks that the degree to which we have a society of consumption in which the way we live is by purchasing commodities and then consuming them, which is undoubtedly our society. Mm -hmm. um, where that society exists, there is more shadow work rather than less. Um, so for instance, where a, um, where a society is basically producing, say, canned goods to take the canned good, to open the canned good, to turn on the stove, to heat the canned good, to put the canned good in the plate and then to put down the knife and fork or whatever, mm -hmm. serve the canned good all without that labor the canned good is stuck in the can, yep. right? So it is necessary to change the production of a co of commodities to actual living, to like mm -hmm. the commodities now enable my further existence. So the way that a, a world of commodities still helps us to subsist in our being, it's necessary to that. You can't do it without it. Nevertheless, it's mm -hmm. not recognized as part of the industrial process, which is and I think he's right here, someone arbitrarily yeah. declared to end once the can is sold, mm -hmm. right? So that was industry, that was work, that was labor. Now no more work. Yeah, now it's we're just satisfying, shadow. we're consuming. But his point is that consumption is a kind of labor within right. consumer societies. Consumption, I mean, if you think about labor as the things we do in order to live, the the things we do in order to consume are the things we do in order to live within a consumer society in which the way we live is through purchasing commodities, but that is not, um, yeah, it's not remediated. I think his egg example is useful. Yeah. Could you read the, could you read the, <laughs> the egg, egg example? example? It's so a controversial, <laughs> this is a controversial egg. It's a controversial egg. Okay. So uh, it begins kind of like with the, kind of like the canned soup example. So the whole thing? Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Might as well. Okay. When a modern housewife goes to the market, picks up the eggs, drives them home in her car, takes the elevator to the seventh floor, turns on the stove, takes butter from the refrigerator and fries the eggs, she adds value to the commodity with each one of the, these steps. This is not what her grandmother did. The latter looked for eggs in the chicken coop, cut a piece from the lard she had rendered, lit some wood her kids had gathered on the commons and added the salt she had bought. Although this example might sound romantic, it should make the economic difference clear. Both women prepare fried eggs, but only one uses a marketed commodity and highly capitalized production, uh, production goods, car, elevator, electric appliances. The grandmother carries out woman's 
gender-specific tasks and creating subsistence, the new housewife must put up with the household burden of her shadow work. Mm -hmm. So I think what he's getting that is that these women are living in two different worlds where one of them is knowledge acknowledges being like an actual like way of life and real labor. This is what you do in order to survive. Whereas for the, the modern housewife, all the shadow work is unacknowledged. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're adding real value mm -hmm. to the egg in order to like eat it. Yep. Um, but it's not acknowledged yeah, it's not acknowledged by society as being yep. real work. Yeah, because so, the only kind of labor that's valuable in today's society is is wage labor, and I think that was a really important point that I picked up from reading this. Um, and I think I can't remember where he talks about it. It might be somewhere around this, like in if 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 what it means to to live means that you have to be dependent on wages then whoever earns the wages is the free and independent one and then whoever depends on the wages is the dependent and so you get a situation where if the man is the breadwinner then he's obviously the one who has like uh individual autonomy and freedom and then it puts a woman in the situation where she's seen as like socially and economically completely dependent but if you live in a subsistent society where you're not simply depending on the wage then the woman's work is acknowledged as being i guess a part of its own own world and, and being valuable and she's not it's it's a it's yeah, a it different kind life. of dependence it gives life still it's not like it's not like the things that aren't involved in production and and wage which is the important stuff but someone's got to do so it might as well be the woman it's like well, the guys might be chopping wood and the woman might be wringing a chicken's neck and those things are going to come together to produce dinner. Mm -hmm. But there's no sense of like the real thing versus the the fake thing. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think the problem within modern societies and the reason why in my experience at least like women are still turns out not happy with their <laughs> <laughs> uh sort of cut of the of the cards here is that you are on the one hand, society has this obvious complete lack of value for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, it's completely necessary. So you are supposed to be paid in the satisfaction you get for updating an unfinished industrial product. Um, mm -hmm. You're... So you're supposed to be... <laughs> so it's not just that you're supposed to be satisfied being a woman or whatever. You're supposed to be satisfied because that's all the pay available to you. Yeah. And if you are not satisfied, you know, just taking the purchases of the commodities produced largely by men and then updating them for consumption, then you have lost everything. Um, there's no affirmation of your the value of what you're doing. Yeah, you, and, it, it reminds me of my complaints with, I don't know, little little clips or maybe commercials where it's like yeah like moms are heroes moms are heroes my mom is a hero and it just seems like you're compensating for something like if you yeah. have to go out of your way to say that then obviously we're living in a world where like this kind of work is not valued yeah not appreciated like whenever i hear that i just i, I I don't know. It just emphasizes that even oh, more. Oh, totally. I mean, presumably a, a a society that just cannot make any artifact without it promoting women's liberation is not a society of liberated women. Mm -hmm. There is a bit, I think Weird Al did it, where like the only <laughs> things we do for women is sell them yogurt and birth control. And I, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. But I'm not just saying that to be brutal because I'm saying that to be brutal because Illich is worse. So I'm going to read you just to get an idea for his full sort of depressing mode here. He's looking at this destruction of. Where is this? Uh, this is moving on from from what you read on page fifty. Oh, he okay. says shadow work could not mm -hmm. have come into existence before the household was turned into an apartment set up for the economic function of upgrading value deficient commodities. All right, that's huge because, again, he's saying right from the beginning he said the only way you get capitalism as a way of social life is by the destruction of gender 
-hmm. You just can't have it otherwise. So part of this is the destruction of a household by which he describes, I mean, I could do the whole like it's from the word that means economy thing, but but from the idea of a place in which all participants are um, adding in asymmetrical, complementary ways to a common good, uh, he's talking about a strict um, purpose, as it were, for this new household, which he calls an apartment, which is the place where you upgrade value deficient commodities. He says shadow work cannot become unmistakably women's work before men's work had moved out of the house to factory or office. Henceforth, the household had to be run on what the paycheck bought. One paycheck for the engineer, and almost inevitably several to feed the hod carrier's family, whose wife took in piecework while his daughter hired out while his da daughter was hired out as a domestic. The unpaid upgrading of what wage labor produced now became women's work. Women were then defined in terms of the new use to which they were being put. Both kinds of work, wage labor and its shadow, proliferated with industrialization. The two new functions, that of the breadwinner and that of the dependent, began to divide society at large. He was identified with overalls and the, and the factory, she with an apron in the kitchen. For the wage labor she was able to find as a sideline, she received sympathy and low pay. Okay, so the point here, one of the points here, is that what you're not seeing is um, a new kind of woman and a new kind of man, except accidentally. So the male and female world is what is being parasitically destroyed by economic sex. And what the wife is actually doing now is a unisex work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to women as such. A man mm -hmm. could do what she's doing. And indeed, Illich goes on to say that with the, with the high capital um, sort of introductions where you take away any skill involved in doing it and you're just using mm -hmm. this machine, that machine – um, it's even more apparent that the work mm -hmm. isn't valued as being proper to women as such. It's simply accidental to women. Like you have, and and I'll get back to that, but basically the point is it could always be done by a male. Mm -hmm. So when he says it's women's work, he's saying that, especially in the beginning of uh, the spread of industrial capitalism, that it's extrinsically women's work. It happens to be women's work. Why? Well, I mean, he doesn't explicitly go into this, but I think it's for the same reason that you see sexism within the reported economy, mm -hmm. which is that because women have children, mm -hmm. they are generally already doing the kinds of food production, the kinds of work that once you make it to the end point of a uh, industrial society, they're kind of already there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get confused. And I think this is basically what the conservative reaction to the 1950s housewife is. It's confusion. Mm -hmm. It's saying like, okay, so the thing that a woman really is, is a housewife by which I mean, uh, by which their imagination is limited to um, the industrial capitalist model, right. where she's the one that stays within this place to do the necessary unpaid updating of value deficient commodities, mm -hmm. right? But it's not women's work by nature. It's not like, you know, women are just more fitting for, I don't know, cooking or something. Yeah, yeah, like I probably once we start getting into the the chapter on the gendered world, it'll mm -hmm. make a little bit more Yeah. Maybe we should sense. have done this whole thing backwards. <laughs> here's the gendered world, here's the thing that ruined it. Well, we did it again, wasted another hour of your time. We're going to split this video in half and you're going to get uh chapter 3, I think, of uh mm -hmm. gender on the next episode. Thanks so much. Bye.